Good day. So for this topic, I'll be discussing briefly about the distributed loading. Okay. And uh, this this lecture is going to be titled Lecture 4.5. So technically, it's still part of four system results. And I think it's pretty important because this would uh, teach it like an intro level for your next topics to come, especially for subjects like uh, string of materials. Um, uh, equilibrium of a region body, internal forces, and, uh, especially in understanding sure and the discussion of that in detail will happen on your next term. So I will be discussing at this high level of it. So to, just to give you an overview, I'm just going to cover the basics and the concepts and um, what you'll probably need from this 4.5. So what to expect. So we will start with why and what is with a distributed uh, loading. Where is it going to be about? When, where, where, where is applied, and how is it related to the other lessons here in statics, but also in strength analysis and materials engineering? Then we'll go over basic application of distributed loading, specifically the unit forwarding loading along the single axis. And lastly, we'll go over some basic sample problems. There's only like four of them, and uh, um, and we'll just get to get it over with, with them. And hopefully, the, those will be enough to you know, understand the concept behind distributed loading okay so what is and why is distributed loading and why is it very important it's pretty important uh because distributed loading is a concept from statics of rigid bodies that deals with loads that are spread out so loads that are spread out over an area or length as opposed to being concentrated at a single point like the ones we've been discussing previously before because in reality forces that is applied over a particular area and we normally call that pressure because every load exerts a pressure on its covered surface area so we have here a sample of uh, some various real life examples and for example forklifts knowing the minimum and maximum load capacity of a forklift before it tips over so there's movement there so you you need to know what uh, what that forklift is rated for it the other part of it is the safety is the forklift rated for proper safety uh is it properly caged does the driver have the proper license and uh are the hydraulics okay are the load is appropriate for the forklift usage the other one is uh designing dams knowing the hydrostatic force that is involved when designing a dam so in this particular thing this is wood over that imagine the amount of hydrostatic force that this particular body of water is exerting on that particular dam and that force is what being used uh to transfer energy from that particular uh, elevation here there's a turbine here there's supposed to be a, yeah, a turbine to generate electrical uh, hydroelectric energy and then of course in the other applications such as like uh deciding cooling towers and well more of facing the cooling towers on top of commercial buildings. It's a meaning if the roof supports or view can take the operating weight of a cooling tower of, on top of a building. And then finally, if you're into stress analysis, uh, considering the aerodynamic initial experience, uh, the airplane, uh, the airplane experience during turbulent and laminar condition, this also applies for both shipbuilding, forces in roll, during high load, no uh, Low load pressure, so low pressure and high pressure. So, knowing the concept of distributed load will help you further understand our succeeding lectures, such as equilibrium on rigid bodies, structural analysis, and of course, internal forces plus friction. Okay, the rest will be discussed in your other subjects in the uh, next term, basically. Next up is here. We're going to be talking about uniform loading along a single axis. So what is this? The most common type of distributed loading encountered in engineering practice is the generally uniform along a single axis. Kibler 2016 page for rain P. So just like I said, if you place an object on a particular surface, that object has a load, has weight. And that weight uh, exerts a pressure over over. Uh, over that particular area. So basically pressure is basically force applied on a particular area. 
And in this particular case, uh, this is the a model that represents that the force is actually scattered across the area here. And you would notice that sometimes that the force is not distributed properly. Okay, so in this case, uh, so it generates a different curve profile, so to speak, when applying force at a particular point in the area here. So the force exerted here is different than the force exerted here because due to the shape, due to the shape of the uh, to the shape of the object and, and the load it 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 uh, and the pressure it it uh, generates basically over that area it's basically scattered if it's a uniform like a brick it's got to be a uniformly distributed load because it's in uniform density it's a uniform shape um, but unfortunately not all objects in real life in engineering are like that but we try to make it so okay so problems involving distributed load uh, normally ask for the total force, the resultant force, and where the force is applied. So we call that the, normally that that resultant force passes through the center point of the, just through the centroid of the object. We just label it as X, uh, X bar. Forget the formal term, okay? And uh, just so to give you a bit of variety, this also happens uh, just like in above sea level conditions. Um, objects experience pressure with and and with and and uh, with pressure comes with forces that is applied over this particular surface area. Here, I got this from a different book. This is a figure showing a submerged plate and and the distribution of forces depending on the depth of uh, the submerged plate here so this is more fluid mechanics it still applies this the newtonian physics still applies but this time you're involving water here and pressure and the figure above is a showcase of distributed loading but under submerged conditions with tilted vertical and horizontal plate scenarios and as you can see um the the exerted pressure as you go down is not equal and and that translates also to the force that it's being exerted on that particular area so it's not constant there and let's say you're perfectly leveled just like so so if it's at the same uh same uh, same uh same height same elevation or same same depth basically the forces are the force are being applied in a, in a very uniform manner and all you have to do is just get the result you don't need to know this yet because this is a topic for uh, uh you, you might have already altered it during your first year, but this is a topic for third years. Okay, so it's practically the same concept, but in, but we're talking about pressure here. So you gotta you you gotta know your density, your specific weights, needles, to, so that you know your pressure here. There's not a lot of uh, there's a bit of integral here, but it's more of explaining why the formula is just like so. Okay. So you will be required to find the hydrostatic force or the total hydrostatic force and where the line of action is being applied here. So in this case, it is the center of pressure YP. So since it's, you know, submerged, so we're dealing with Y-axis in this particular case, at least from our point of view, right? And slanted conditions for, for vertical and slanted position or the distance of centroid YC plus gap from the surface water. So, so the distance of YC is the distance of centroid, which is YC plus the gap from the surface water. So that's basically here. So that, that that's the gap here. When it's horizontal, basically your YC, your centroid, is equal to uh, your 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 H here is basically equal to your uh, distance of centroid YC, and there's no particular gap. It's all the way here, and that's it provided. Okay. You'll learn more about this in the weekend, so you don't need to learn. So I'm just showing you some variety. Okay. So let's have a bit of mathematics. Okay, so mathematically, just bear with me lang. The uniform loading along an axis is basically, we're trying to find the total force exerted here over this particular change in length here. That's basically it. And Wx here is basically force per unit length here. And, uh, mathematically speaking, the force resultant is just the is equal to the area under the curve, the total area under the curve, or essentially the pressure times area and 
Okay, so that's uh, that's basically force is equal to pressure times area, or in 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 integration, calculus speaking, that's basically the area under the curve beta. And for the location of the resultant force, which normally passes through the centroid of the object, um, is given as the quotient of the integral of the product of force per unit length and the centroid distance of uh, oops, wait lang. Oh. Uh, as the, as the quotient of the integral of the product of force per unit length and the centroid distance over force resultant. We can do all this or in terms of location resultant or you can just memorize the basic ratios of the centroids of basic shapes which I will show you in the upcoming. For example, for triangle, uh, the distance of the larger force to the applied force is about one third. And then from the lower force to the applied force, that's going to be two thirds. For a rectangle, that's basically L over, that's basically the total length over two uh, to determine if it's a uniform uh, applied uh, material. You would know that the force applied here is going to be in the middle. You will encounter this particular problem in equilibrium of rigid body. For example, the weight of a particular plate, the uniform plate, is say 100 kilograms. So it won't tell you where it is, it will give you dimensions. It's a very uniform shape, so all you have to do is just find the center of this particular plate, and there you go. That's where the force, that, that's where the weight of the object is concentrated. So in this particular case, you can use the integration way of solving the resultant force and the location of the resultant force, or you can use basic geometry in terms of solving the resultant force and in the the resultant force and the location of the resultant. Because if you know the equation, the area for, for example, its parabolic area for this chain and region, then it's just a matter of just getting that area left. So let's try for uh, some sample problems. So for here, we are determining the magnitude and location of the equivalent resultant force acting on the shaft in the figure shown below. So we're given here this particular bar. Uh, uh, and, and we're being asked to find the area under the curve here. And this equation is 60x squared newton over meter. The max here is 240 newtons over meter. So this, we're given the maximum here and we can then zero as the minimum. So here, DA here is WDX. And here is the location of the, basically the, we get the location here is basically X times whatever equation here of the, to get the uh, center for the location of the equivalent force. So we're given in W as 68 squared, the total length is 2 meters. The solution, so there's actually two ways. First one is we get this, the, we get the integration, the DA, where simply from 0 meter to 2 meters, 68 squared DX, and the integration of this would be would yield as to 60x cubed over 3 and then the bar 2, 0. All we have to do is just expand this further. So 60 times the difference between 2x cubed over 3 minus 0 cubed over 3, which will give you 160 newtons. If you still recall your integration, that's pretty much it. All you have to do is just substitute that equation there. That function 60x squared there to your, to your equation. Now for the location of the equivalent resultant, all you have to do is just get the integral of x dA over the force resultant. So x times uh, dA here is this one, 60x squared dx, which will give you 60x to the fourth over 4. And then you substitute 2 and 0, which will give you at 1.5 meters. So that is the more mathematical way of solving it. Or you can just simply use the standard x parabolic formula that you will find in your book, Geometric Properties of Mice and Area Elements, which is this one. And for the area and center and location, as you can see here, basically the force resultant is just the, it's just the area under the curve. And if you know the area under the curve, which is simply one third times A and B. So A here is uh, three meet, uh, two meters and B here is 240 newton meters times 1 over 3, then you will get the area. And then to know the, the center and location, you just have to choose. So that's going to be 3 fourths. And from here to here, that's going to be 3 fourths of A. 
And uh, if we're going to choose this part, that's fine also. If you're given A, if you're only given B, that's basically three tenths of B. Okay. And uh, let's apply it. So for the location, that's going to be three parts of L here. So the total length is two meters. So you will have about 1.5 meters. So two over four, that's oh, three over two, that's 1.5. And then for the area, it's basically getting the forces all that AB over T. So that's 2 meters times 240 Newton over meters. That's the total, uh, it's the total uh, height, basically, of this particular diagram and over T. And you would get 116 Newtons. So essentially, there's two ways. You can solve these particular equations by integration or simply you solve them geometrically. So as long as you know the area here. Let's let's try for something much more simple in shape here. And uh, this happens a lot. Actually. For distributed loading of function P equals to 800x Pascal, acts over the top surface of the beam shown in figure shown below. Uh, determine the magnitude and location of the equivalent. So again, we can solve this either in by integration or by, ge by by geometry. So by integration first. So all we have to do since p is equals 800 x is given, all we have to do now is just multiply first point two here to convert it into a distributed loading into a single axis. So that's our function here: 160 x newton meter. So that's gonna be it. 160x newton meter. Okay. So if we're going to do it by integration, the resultant force here is an integral of uh, 160x from 0 to 9. To get the summation of 160x from 0 meters 9 meters, that will be x squared over 2. So we substitute that. So we will have the answer as. 6,480 newtons or 6.48 newtons. Now, as for the location, so we just get the product of the D from dA and x. So that's 160x times x. That's 160x squared divided by the the uh, forces all time. And we will have the location 6 meters. Okay, so that's the that's the solution by integration. We're gonna check it in by geometry. We're basically looking at a triangle like ito. So basically all we have to do is just to get the area of the triangle. That's basically base times height over two. So to get the area by geometry, get the force resultant by by geometry, all we have to do now is okay. Area of the triangle here is basically Maximum the B here is 1,440 Newton meter. That's basically 160 times 9. That's 1,414 Newton meter. So that's 9 meters times 1,440 divided by 2 is equals to 6,480 or 6.48 kilonewtons. You can check. And as for the triangle, naman, and uh, as for the location, the uh, resultant force or where the resultant force is applied. Basically, I can judge it from here two thirds. From this point to here, that's practically two thirds times nine uh, times a. So that's gonna be nine meters. So that's six meters. You, or you can also use it the distance from here. So that's gonna be nine minus one third minus a over t minus a over t. So that's nine minus uh, nine over t. That's gonna be six meters as well. If you're judging it from here. So this is one third. Let's put, let's put the, uh, the, so here, it's probably here. So basically this one here is two thirds. A and this one here is third. Just basically how you solve it. Let's have two more problems so that uh, we cover all bases. Okay, so here no man, we're here to determine the resultant force and specify where the axis on the beam measured from A. So in this particular case, uh, um, we're going to combine distributed loading plus moment force. So we're we're not only going to apply, okay, where the force is all that is, but where is it located as well? So, so we have here different uh, loads. 
arbitrary uh, distributed load system so 6 kN per meter 9 kN meter and 3 kN per meter with their specific um, dimensions so all we have to do first okay so we find the resultant force and specify where it acts on the lead that's pretty much easy as to where as to where it acts on the beep, we will get that by getting the moment. So first things first, distributed loading. We're given already that. The first thing we have to do here is convert the distributed load into a concentrated load first. Okay, so how do we do that? So we get that by here. So we get by getting, for example, force 1, we're just going to label it as 6 kN force 2 and then force 3. You multiply 6 kN meter by the total distance from their, uh, from their given uh, dimension. So in this case, 6 times 1.5, 9 kN times 3 is 27, and then 3 kN times 1.5, that's going to be 4.5 kN. Now, Given all the forces are downward in this particular case, it doesn't make sense that we not a shock negative. So for this particular convention, we're going to make it as positive now. So our goal is to determine the resultant force and the location. So the resultant force is just simply the summation of all these forces, 9 plus 27 plus 4.5. It's going to be 40.5 kilonewtons. Already got one. I love that opinion. So the question is, where? To so know where, we're going to make a simple diagram. Okay, so we're going to get the moments of each of these particular forces. The moments that this force generates. Force 1, force 2, so that's going to be moment 1, moment 2, moment 3, moment 4. So the next step is basically to determine the moment per concentrated load. So for concentrated load at 6 kN, it's going to look somewhat like this. Then the applied force at point. Yeah, so it's going to be... Moment 1 is force 1 times the, uh, times the perpendicular, this one is equals to 9 kN times 1.5 over 2. That's basically it. Because, you know, it's distributed in the location of the centroid, the 6 kN meter, or the, the 9 kN is probably in, in the middle, okay? Okay, so there we go. All we have to do the now dito is just move it about A. I can choose anything, but I think A is the much more practical sense dito. Doesn't make sense to for them B here. Okay, so this is gonna be move it about A here. So that's gonna be 6.75 kN per meter. Next up is for moment two. So this is the representation. So it's gonna be the concentrated load of F2, that's 27 kN meter, move it about A. It's negative 40.5 kN because it's going to be rotating clockwise. And then finally, in 3 kN meter, still moment about A. Ignoring the reaction, so it's 4P. So that's going to be clockwise parent with 1.5 times 3. 1.5 over 2. Plus 3. Times negative 4.5. So notice the 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 length is divided by half with this concentrated load. So that's gonna be negative 16.875 kilonewton meter. Now to get the moments here, all we simply have to add the following. But please remember that the 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 resultant moment is equals also to the resultant force times its perpendicular distance and that's the one we're trying to determine in this particular case we can safely assume that the resultant force is somewhere in the middle so the moment about a it's gonna be clockwise so it's gonna be negative fr times d and also the resultant moment is equal to the summation of all individual moments so we can equate both equation here into dfr plus 2 Force resultant times perpendicular distance times uh, equals to the moment of force 1, 2, and 3. And we will get the distance here, isolating it, and we will have 1.25 meters from point A.
If we chose point B, we will receive a different one to go, but I haven't tried it there. Okay, let's try another one, but this time uh, in the regular shape. So this one is part triangle and part rectangle. Determine the resultant force and specify where it acts and then be measured from A. So we're given specify from A to B. Actually, is it? Oh, so we're, yeah. So anyway, we're already specified pala from A dito. So hence, 1.25 meters from point A lang talaga yung nagigisagot dito unless otherwise specified. Okay, determine the resultant force and specify where it acts on the beam measured from A. It's pretty much the same pa rin naman. So in this particular case, so we're here to determine the first resultant and where it's being applied from point A. So the solution first here is let's try to break it down this finger further. So we do this by separating this one first. And so that's gonna be 150. And this one is 200. Yeah. This is going to be 150 muna. So we convert this to a concentrated load lang muna. So that's going to be 150 pound feet. Pound over feet. Times 6. So the concentrated load is 900 pound force in the middle. That's 3 feet from A. There we go. So the moment it generates. The, the moment the force generates is negative 900. It's, it's clockwise from A. So rotating about A. And that's going to be negative 2,700 pound force feet. The next step is now we treat this separately. This is a triangle now. So all we have to do is this is 0 0.0 and here is 200 minus 150. So we just got to get that lamp. So all we have to do here is just get the area under here. So that's going to be uh, 6 feet times the height here. That's 200 minus 150 pound force over feet. That's going to give you 150 pound force. And we will now find the moment here. Which is quite easy because we know by by geometry, uh, this is the the location of the force is molten. We gotta put a finger here. So well, it's probably somewhat here. That's your force resultant for the triangle. And this one here is it is basically two thirds of the of the length. So that's gonna be two thirds of six. This one is just one third. Six. There we go. So we use two thirds uh, from this from this point to here. So that's two thirds of six feet times negative one fifty pound force because it's gonna be rotating clockwise. There we go. There we go. So that's gonna be negative six hundred force feet. So the next step here is also to get force three, which is five hundred pound force here. And just get the moment, which is 500 times perpendicular distance about A. That's um, from the, uh, that's clockwise, so that's negative 500 times 9, A plus 6, equals to negative 4,500 pound force feet. So solving for the resultant force, all you have to do is just get the summation of all the y-axis. We just assume everything going down would as possible, since our goal is just getting all the resultant force, 900 plus 150 plus 500. That will give you 1,150 pound force. Now the location of where, just get the moment. So again, recall that the resultant moment is equal to the, the force resultant times its perpendicular distance, which is the unknown. Also, the moment about A is also the summation of all moments one for, uh, generated by force one, force two, and force three. So you equate those equations and isolate the uh, the variable D. So this is negative one. D, you will get. This one is negative 7,800 over negative 15550. Our first power first cancel. And the answer here is 5.0 feet feet from point A. Again, if you have questions here, just feel free to ask me. We'll just go over this. So just so you know, these are the distrib this is these are the geometric properties of line and area elements if they're located in the back of your book. You won't need to memorize them, but just memorize the basic shape. So that like triangle, rectangular, and circular area. That's pretty much it. Because you you'll be using this on your third year as well. There you go.